Hi friends, Editing Emily here, and before we jump into my May wrap-up, I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge what is happening in the world right now. Following the murder of George Floyd by police officers, there has been a huge movement in the United States and around the world to speak out against racism and police brutality. There will be resources linked in the description box down below if you haven't been engaging with this because it doesn't seem relevant to you or you don't know what to say or you don't know what to do. Stop. <laughs> Please. It is never too late to learn. It is never too late to learn about anti-racism and to begin striving to be anti-racist. Um, and so the resources down below will be organizations that are doing work that need our support. There will be links to reading lists on how to educate yourself about anti-racism, about white supremacy, and how we can all be striving to do better. To my fellow Canadians who often define ourselves in opposition to the states, I would recommend that you pick up The Hanging of Angelique by Afua Cooper. This is about the history of slavery in Canada. Yes, we had slavery for 206 years. The Canada that you see today was built on Indigenous and African slaves. I'm specifically calling out Canadians because the rhetoric that I have been challenging a lot in the past week or so is a lot of people being like, oh my gosh, the states are bananas, how can they be so racist, it's all because of their history of slavery, when we have a history of slavery, we benefit from that history of slavery, that labor that has gone into the land, the colonization of the land. <laughs> the difference between Canada and the States is that in the narrative making of North America, in the narrative making of Canada, we have done a very effective job of erasing our history of slavery. Part of the narrative making of Canada is that um, we were this place of freedom because that is where the Underground Railroad that was a last stop on the Underground Railroad was Canada, the land of the free, the land of freedom. We have really leaned into that narrative and used it to paper over and write over our own history of slavery. We need to do better. We need to educate ourselves. And the other thing that I am seeing is folks in Europe seem to have uh, stepped back from this. Also, in the like, this is an American problem, it's not. Europeans, you might find this educational as well, um, because it talks about the invention of the Atlantic slave trade and the powers that were involved in that. Countries that I didn't even think, like that hadn't even occurred to me. Portugal uh, in 1444 was like, the inventor of the African slave trade. Uh, the Dutch got really invested in it. The Spanish got really invested in it. I think we need to remember because it has probably been erased from your history books just as it was erased from my Canadian history books is that the history of the world is a history of racism. Just because right now in America things are particularly bad doesn't mean that we can step away from it, um, doesn't mean that we can say, well, that's an American problem, because it's not. So I will leave links in the description box. The other link that I am going to leave for you is a playlist of Black booktubers. And what I want you to do is watch the playlist and subscribe to the folks that you actually click with. There's a range of black booktubers on this list that read different things. Not everyone is going to click with everybody's reading tastes. And so what I want you to do is to watch, engage, and subscribe to the humans that you will actually watch because you like the same things they do. I am open to criticism on this. Being an empty subscriber does nothing but mess with the analytics and engagement of these black booktubers. Performative subscribing, performative liking 
does nothing because you're not an engaged member of their audience then. You're not connecting with another human and hearing their voice and their perspective. All you are doing is making yourself feel better, maybe, and fucking with their analytics. And why does that matter? Fucking with someone's analytics and engagement matters because capitalism has its sticky little fingers all over everything. Right now, a lot of these channels have engaged audiences. They don't have the subscriber counts that they deserve, but they have engaged audiences. A lot of brands recognize the value of engagement. They recognize the value of a hand sell. Seeing good subscriber to views ratio means something. It's sellable. Seeing that a creator has similar numbers of subscribers across Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, whatever platforms they use, shows a dedicated audience, and that is marketable. In these moments, when it is trendy to subscribe, trendy to follow, without engagement, what we do is we fuck up the brand. We fuck up the markability of these creators. I don't know if any of these creators have the intention of monetizing themselves or if this is just a hobby because I don't know what's going on in their head, what they have plans for themselves. It's an option right now and I will leave a link as well to how engagement, how dedication can actually lead to a full-time job being an online creator. Quantity of subscribers doesn't matter as much as engagement. So, and it may be an unpopular opinion, it may be an unpopular perspective, and please I'm open to criticism on this, but from the more business, financial side of things, being an empty subscriber does nothing. It boosts their subscriber count, but it does nothing in terms of your learning as somebody who is following diverse voices, hearing different perspectives, it does nothing for you, your learning and your engagement as a person, and it does nothing for the creator that you empty follow because you just fuck with their analytics. What being a creator with an engaged audience does is give you the power to say to companies, I can hand sell this. I know I have an engaged audience who trusts me, who trusts my opinions, and I can hand sell this product. <laughs> that is something that if you, you go and empty subscribe to these people, you take away from them. To my black viewers, I stand with you, I support you, and I pledge to be anti-racist, to engage in the practice and the learning of being anti-racist for the rest of my life. I pledge to do better always. Not just now because it's trending following a tragedy, not just every time there is tragedy, I pledge to do better always. There's no good way to transition to the pre-filmed wrap-up, so here we go. Hi friends, my name is Emily and welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to be sharing with you the things that I read in the month of May. So May 2020 was a little bit interesting. We have the corona pandemic still happening, but also partway through I was called back to work for a few shifts a week. They're trying to reopen at the bookstore that I work at, Indigo, but obviously we're not back to regular time of year. So like things are changing, schedules are changing, my mental energy has changed. And so you may have noticed that in April I read an obscene amount of books and in May not quite so many. Um, I'm sure we're all sort of dealing with this in different ways and I will say that during the month of May I started and did not finish a bunch of books. I tried to reread A Darker Shade of Magic by V.E. Schwab. I wanted to reread the first book to maybe get into the rest of the series and I, I started listening to it on audio as the reread. I thought, oh, I can quickly reread it on audio and then jump into the next one. And I just didn't have the attention span at the beginning of May for this like complex world building. So then I tried something a little bit simpler that I had heard a lot about, started listening to An Ember in the Ashes, which is a YA fantasy, and again ran into the same problem that like I just didn't have the mental energy for world building, so I scrapped that. And then I started Down Days, an apocalyptic novel about a plague, and I was really excited for this like laughing plague novel. But then based on everything else, I actually finished. I 
put that down. I started If It Bleeds by Stephen King, and again, it's a collection of four short stories, four novellas. So I've worked through the first two. I'm a little bit burnt out on Stephen King, especially like the recent response of the Stephen King community bored in quarantine um, being really aggressive. I've talked about that a couple of times, um, I think most specifically, most recently in my booktube oldie tag, which I'll link above. I feel no sense of urgency to finish If It Bleeds and review it, so again, put it down. And then I've also started Cinder by Marissa Meyer, a fairy tale retelling about an android Android? Cyborg. Cinderella. It's fine. I don't know if I'm gonna finish it. Again, I'm borrowing a lot of these on audio from the library. So those are things that I started and haven't finished. Um, and I'm curious if anyone else is sort of in this place right now where certain things just aren't working for you as a reader. I would love to see how other people are like emotionally dealing with this quarantine situation. So on to the things that I did finish. So the first thing that I finished was Come Tumbling Down by Seanan McGuire. So this is the fifth book in the Wayward Children series by Seanan McGuire. At the beginning of this COVID lockdown, I mentioned like five escapist fantasy reads, I'll link it above, that I thought would be fun to get into. And I thought I had read this and I was looking for it on my shelves, couldn't find it. Then I found it on my unread bookshelf. Plot twist, I had read most of this in January and retained none of it. I put it back on my TBR shelf for that reason. And so as I was reading this, I was like, no, I'm pretty sure I've read this, but I can't remember anything. Just fun, personal, reading things. Earlier this year, I went to the breast assessment clinic to see if uh, I had a tumor. <laughs> and it was a really stressful day. I got lost in the belly of the cancer hospital. They said, go in any door. Go in any door and you will be able to like find your way to this clinic. And so I literally went into the door closest to the parking lot where I parked and uh, somehow ended up in like the basement of the hospital, like janitorial buckets of like used gowns, uh, gurneys. I'm pretty sure the morgue was probably down there if I'd gotten any more lost. Like that is the sort of like area I ended up in this hospital. It was also still all decorated for like the 1950s when the cancer hospital was built. Um, so it was like really grungy, really dark, really like, ooh, which was adding to this experience, right? <laughs> I'm sharing this story because like it's funny in hindsight because I don't have cancer, yay. And like it's funny how much of like where you are mentally affects what you're reading, which is why I'm sharing this story. So um, I got myself finally into the uh, breast assessment clinic and I'm the youngest person there. I'm sitting in this room reading this book and like waiting for my turn. I'm reading Come Tumbling Down and like there's a part in the book where like when I first picked this up, you can clearly see I made it like this far in the hospital because the book falls open to that point. So that's that's where I made it to. And I had retained none of this. Something that I am very aware of as somebody who makes videos online is how much of like where we are at in our lives affects how we're reading. In the front of this book, I have like the date and the extension number and the appointment time and like all of this, I stuck all of this information about the cancer hospital that I was visiting into the front of this book. Um, it was weird to pick it up again and to, because you know, once they like cleared me, no cancer, hooray, like I moved on. Um, and I totally put this book away. Um, and it was weird picking this up at the beginning of May and sort of going back to that time. It's just interesting to see how the text that you bring along with you to places in your life, times in your life, have stuff associated with them. So rereading this this time during the pandemic, now this has like two things associated with it. So this is the story of Jack who has returned to her 
forever home on the moors. One day she shows up back at the school in Jill's body uh, because Jill has swapped bodies with her so that she can become a vampire because her body was tainted and she needed a fresh body so she stole her twin's body and uh, Jack is desperately trying to get her body back and she needs help. She needs the help of her wayward friends and so they go on to this adventure into these very like dark gothic moors. If you love Dracula, if you love a lot of that early gothic horror, there's a lot of those vibes here. I am fascinated by the sea creatures, the very gothic sea creatures, and I would love to see Sean McGuire explore that more at some point. Like the moors absolutely fascinate me in a way that some of the other places we have visited don't, like the nonsensical cotton candy floof world. Not really my jam, but the moors, the worlds where there's a lot of death, do really check my boxes. And so I loved this. And so even though this book has like two uh, sort of negative experiences, negative times in my life associated with it, it does seem fairly appropriate that I was reading a book about like this really dark place during two fairly dark times for myself. The reason I mention these dark times is I don't know how this will feel to you if you are having a good time in your life. I loved it. I absolutely loved this. And uh, this did come from my TBR and I gave it four to five stars. So the next book that I read in May was Lyriel by Garth Nix. So this is the next book in the Old Kingdom series. I loved Sabriel by Garth Nix. I loved the idea of the abortion, this necromancer, fighting creatures in death. It like very much checks a lot of my uh, deathling boxes. I was a little disappointed when we didn't continue on with Sabriel as a character and we switched to Lyriel and uh, Sabriel's son, Samus, perspective. Um, and so this alternates back and forth between Lyriel, who is in a magical library, loved that, that was wonderful. Um, and Samoth, he's the abortion in waiting and he really doesn't want to be the abortion in waiting. I enjoyed this, but not as much as I enjoyed Sabriel. I almost wish that I hadn't gotten so attached to Sabriel in the first book, because like Sabriel was a five out of five star book for me. I was so excited to get back into Sabriel's world, to not see a lot of Sabriel, to not spend a lot of time with Sabriel was a little bit disappointing. And I almost wish that Sabriel was a prequel and I had started with Lyriel, if that makes sense. Because I think I maybe would have liked Lyriel more if I hadn't already fallen in love with Sabriel, right? This I did give four to five stars, so a step down from uh, Sabriel, which was five out of five stars for me. I believe it was a five star prediction and I did give it five stars. So that was from my TBR. The next book that I read was Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. Obviously this was a reread and I actually really enjoyed this this time around. There is a lot going on in this book in terms of the rise of Voldemort, the critique that we see happening of the wizarding world with the house elves, and I think masculinity is also a thing that is worth looking at in this book. Um, and so I do have three episodes for Lumos planned on this. It was just a fun reread to return to this childhood favorite. I love the Triwizard tournaments uh, more than I love Quidditch, so this was at least fun. I have hated all of the like action-packed Quidditch matches that uh, we get to experience in the first three books. Like they do nothing for me as an adult, but the Triwizard tournaments are at least fun. I have to say though, I feel really bad for the spectators of the Triwizard Tournament events because other than the dragon, they're just sitting around watching an empty lake for an hour and then they're sitting around watching the outside of a maze for an hour. Like I feel like there needed to be like a little line about like some sort of magical big screen so that people could see what was going on underwater and in the maze because what are they watching as a tournament? And that had never occurred to me before. 
But uh, yeah, I really enjoyed this. I have a vlog. If you want to see me reacting to this in real time, I will link it. It's been really nice revisiting a childhood favorite, a comfort series. And if you haven't read Harry Potter, this may be the time to pick it up. They are comforting, they are easy reading uh, if you want easy reading, but there's a lot going on there if you want to engage a little bit deeper. Next book that I finished was um, Interview with a Vampire, which is the first book in the Vampire Chronicles by Anne Rice. And so I have to say I really liked the formatting of this book. So I started reading this in physical and then discovered that this used copy that I got from a thrift store had been used as like a cut and paste project by somebody. So somebody has gone through and like cut out words for some sort of collaging and then donated this book. So I I can make educated guesses, but it's annoying. It's annoying to make educated guesses when somebody has done a collage project with your book. So I did borrow it from the library to actually read it and I borrowed it on audio, which I think is a fantastic way to approach this because it's an interview format. We have this person meeting up with a vampire in a bar and being like, so tell me about your life. How did you become a vampire? What was it like being a slave plantation owner? How did you get from there to here? And I think the interview format does exceptionally well on audiobook. I mean, I think it's a little bit of a blessing in disguise that somebody chose to cut up this copy of the book because then it meant that I did experience the audiobook. I feel like a lot of the vampire books that we have that are popular now, like Twilight, whatever, hint at a long backstory for the vampire who's been around for hundreds of years. And this actually gives us like, what is that like? I am excited to continue on with this and I think I might seek out the audiobooks from my library because of this interview format. Would definitely recommend checking it out on audiobook if you haven't already. The next book that I finished was The Stand and oh boy am I glad I finished this. So this I was reading for the final installment of chapter one of the Red Rum Book Club which is a Patreon exclusive book club and I plowed my way through this. I dug in my heels for like a week. I finished it and then when I had finally finished it I took out my feels by very cathartically tossing it across the room. I feel like there is a tighter, more compelling story within here about humanity and the ugliness of being human, uh, what it is like at the very core of our natures to be human. I think that's all in here. I think it's, there is an interesting uh, commentary to be had from the stand. It's not for me. Let's just say that. This is my second try at the stand. There will be no full review for this because I don't want to engage with the constant reader community. So that was a reread and I gave it one out of five stars. The next book that I read was Briar Rose by Jane Yolen. So if we want to talk about setting myself up for failure, reading slumps, going from a book that I really did not like to a really like dark and emotionally intense uh, reading experience, I made so many good choices in May. So Briar Rose is a Holocaust novel. It's using the Briar Rose fairy tale to talk about an extermination camp called Kelmno, which is one of the lesser known camps. Like there are a lot of really big name camps, Auschwitz, Bergen-Belsen, Dachau, like there are some big name camps, but if you want to go down a rabbit hole, just look up list of camps and there are way more than you might think just based on like the big name camps that get talked about a lot, that get addressed in fiction a lot, that get addressed in non-fiction a lot, films, television, etc. Um, so it was interesting to see Yolin pick up a story where there are no like memorial survivor groups because not enough people survived. There are, I believe at this point, seven 
humans who survived because this is looking at the history of an extermination camp. There are on historical records seven Jewish survivors from this extermination camp. Uh, Yolin is picking up this historical moment and adding an eighth survivor. Um, in her research at the time there were only four survivors and she's the fifth but more uh, narratives have expanded this. So anyways this is the story of Becca whose grandmother Gemma passes away at the beginning of the novel and leaves this box of immigration papers and we can see the fluctuation of her grandmother's identity. Becca goes on this journey to try and uncover her grandmother's history, how she ended up in America in a refugee camp, um, how she ended up a single mother, all of this family history that Gemma was too traumatized, I guess, to ever talk about. But she used this tweaked version of the Sleeping Beauty fairy tale to, in reality, impart her story. And I don't think that's a spoiler to say. I think you need to be prepared for what you're going into. So this is an important read. It resulted in me doing a lot of research. I will link the vlog above, but I think you also need to be mentally prepared to take this on. I would maybe recommend doing this as a buddy read or a book club read so you have another human to deal with the feelings with. Because I did this alone <laughs> and this put me in a really dark place. That was a five-star read because I think it's a really important read. I think it's a really well-crafted, well-researched piece of Holocaust fiction for children, and it was a reread. Then, because I apparently hate myself and I was in a really dark place, anyway, I felt like <laughs> reading some nonfiction about a mortician was the next place to go. And so I read Past Mortems by Carla Valentine, who is a UK-based mortician. The term mortician, like I think of Caitlin Doty, who is an American who is preparing bodies for viewings. Um, it seems what mortician in or mortuary technician um, in the UK does is not prepare bodies for like funerals as much as determines cause of death through autopsy, which is not what I get the impression that a mortician does in America. And so it was a slightly different look. Um, so we see Valentine working in hospitals, learning her craft, I guess. Unfortunately, because I am curious and self-sabotaging, um, I did a lot of Googling of terms of the things that she was talking about. I think the one that stands out the most is she's talking about the indications that somebody has indeed died that they used to look for before, you know, we could determine death other ways. Like back in the day when they weren't good at determining whether somebody was really dead and they had like death houses to look for signs of decomposition. Like one of the the signs was this like green um, greenness in the like pelvic area that would spread across your pelvic area and I was like hmm I wonder when she says green does she really mean green? Like you know when you think of like a, like a paint box uh, for kids and you're like, green, that's real green. And uh, yep, I did a lot of Googling for a lot of the things that she mentioned because she just sort of casually throws in references. If anyone's looking at my Google search history, I look like some sort of uh, psycho probably. I looked at and thought a lot about death after reading an apocalyptic novel and a holocaust novel, really feeding that really dark place I was in. I enjoyed this. I got a lot out of it. I learned a lot. I sort of fed this curiosity monster. I don't know what it's like to drink with me. <laughs> Back in the day when uh, we were allowed to go places, I would frequently regurgitate this like odd information to people after I'd had like a little bit of a drink in me and be like, hmm, have you heard of rice water stool? Well, I have a whole host of fun facts about the human body and decomposition now. Five out of five stars, would recommend, and that did come from my TBR. Continuing on with uh, the sort of like death 
and Darkness, I went into Abortion, which is the immediate sequel to Lyriel. So we're picking up with Lyriel and Samoth, and they are trying to stop this big, bad, fantasy, necromancy stuff from happening. No spoilers, but this is the third book. It was fine. <laughs> I feel like my enthusiasm for the series just takes a step down with each book because I was just so in love with Sabriel that these are not the people I want to hang out with. This was three out of five stars for me. This did come from my TBR. I can't really say too much about it because like everything that I like about this series is still true. The necromancy, the stepping into death, the dead hands, all that is still true. Um, I just, I'm not as attached to the characters as I was with Sabriel. And then I decided to pick up The Knife of Never Letting Go by Patrick Ness. So the box set that I ordered at the beginning of this quarantine finally arrived. Uh, I don't know anything about this series. I've heard a lot about it. Fuck it, let's just start it, see where it goes. I got sucked in. The first thing you find out when your dog learns to talk is that dogs don't got nothing much to say about anything. Need a poo, Todd. Shut up, Menchie. Poo. Poo, Todd. I said shut it. We're walking across the wild field southeast of town, those ones that slope down to the river and head on towards the swamp. Ben sent me to pick him some swamp apples and he's made me take Menchie with me. Even though we know Killian only bought him to stay on Mayor Prentice's good side so suddenly, here's this brand new dog as a present for my birthday last year when I never said I wanted any dog and that's what I said I wanted was for Killian to finally fix the fission bike so I wouldn't have to walk every forsaken place in this stupid town. But oh no, happy birthday Todd, here's a brand new puppy Todd and even though you don't want him, even though you never asked for him, guess who has to feed him and train him and wash him and take take him for walks and listen to him jabber now that he's got old enough to get the chalking germ to set his mouth moving. Guess who? Poo! Menchie barks quietly to himself. Poo, poo, poo. Just have your stupid poo and quit yapping about it. That was like a cold open that I hadn't expected. It was at first a little bit odd to get used to the writing style because Todd is an uneducated boy. We are hearing his thoughts as they occur. It's very much like a stream of consciousness novel, so there's very little punctuation and at first it was really hard to read. I was hooked by this like talking dog, by the idea that there's this germ that makes dogs talk and I got sucked in so quick. It was silly and unexpected but also heartfelt and like a fast-paced read. So yeah, um, I'm really excited to continue on with the trilogy. I guess the most important thing that is worth mentioning is that this is set on a new world. So humans have traveled from the old world to this new planet, they have colonized it, and they have fought this war with an alien race they call the Spackle, and there is apparently some biological warfare that has happened, and the Spackle released this germ. All men are just sort of oozing and radiating their thoughts at all time, and so there's no secrets, there's no privacy, everybody is sort of in each other's noise all the time. This novel really kicks off when Todd discovers quiet. If you have had this on your TBR for a while, you've been thinking about it, I do think it's a really like fun, fast-paced read. It's a good mix of humor and emotion and commentary. I enjoyed it. So I gave it five out of five stars and it did come from my TBR. I would love to know your thoughts on any of these books in the comments down below. Uh, did you like any of these books? Have you read any of these books? I would also love to know your thoughts on how situation affects your reading. I mentioned at the beginning of this video like the experience of reading a book while in like a cancer hospital and also I'm curious how once we are out of this COVID pandemic how I will look back on a lot of these books that I read during this time. So I'm curious if anyone else has these sort of time and place reads where a book is really intimately linked with like a stressful living situation and if you have reread any of these books what that has done 
It's maybe too big a question, maybe worth an entirely separate video, but uh, a little taste of it in the comments if you have anything to share. Thank you patrons for making videos like this possible. I really appreciate your support during these weird times. Even though I'm back at work, I'm only getting 15 hours a week. So again, that little bit of support is a big help. If you are interested in supporting the channel, one of the perks right now is the Red Room Book Club. It's open to patrons at any tier, so for as little as a dollar a month, you can become a patron, get access to the Discord group, and the live stream discussing the book on June 26th. We are reading the fantasy plague novel, The Fireman by Joe Hill, which is about this magical, over-the-top plague called dragon scale where you get these beautiful like gold and black scale marks on your skin before bursting into flame. I've started reading it now. It is a very fast-paced read. If you are interested in like a book club read, buddy read, a little bit of like not so real plague read. I will link the Patreon page in the description box down below. If you liked what you saw here today, please give the video a thumbs up and consider subscribing. That would be cool. I will see you very soon with another video. Bye.